Okay, so what, what I would like to do is I would like to introduce our department, introduce what we do, and then obviously focus on the main program that hopefully you came for, and that's our BA Languages and Cultures with a focus on Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, I hope that some of you uh, already know something about SOAS, but SOAS is a very unique institution. It's the only uh, university in the UK that actually specializes in the study of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And our department, the School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics, is the only um, department which actually has um, a comprehensive coverage of the languages and cultures uh, of these regions. Um, so, of course, you know, we are teaching, but also researching uh, some of the most dynamic uh, and also diverse regions in the world. Uh, uh, you know, Asia, Africa, the Middle East uh, are regions which are fascinating, you know, mix of cultures, languages, religions, traditions. But at the same time, it's a very modern, upcoming sort of area, you know, it's very dynamic, a very fast changing um, you know, part of the world. Uh, and it's, uh, these regions are playing increasingly a very sort of uh, important and strategic role in global affairs and in a global society. Um, so uh, the basic philosophy behind what we do is based on the fact that we uh, approach these uh, regions uh, from their own perspective and we base our uh, teaching and research on the knowledge of language. So really we believe that obviously uh, knowing the language uh, is the best way the deepest way how you can engage engage with different cultures. Um, so all of our programs uh, incorporate a study of language. I will move uh, to the next slide. And uh, I have also noticed that uh, another colleague uh, has joined us, and that's uh, our colleague Nari Sharma, who is our South Asianist. So if uh, you are interested in the South Asian part of this um, degree, then uh, obviously please ask questions and we will be able to you know, give you a little bit more insight. Um, so, uh, broadly speaking, we, we uh, focus on the study of languages, cultures, uh, film or screen studies. Uh, we uh, engage with issues of gender, decolonization, all these issues um, form a very important part of, of our curriculum. Uh, but as I have said, at the heart of our programs is the study of languages. Um, we have a very uh, broad range of language, languages uh, we teach. Uh, I think I can find a slightly more detailed uh, list. Uh, this is you know, uh, an example of the languages which we currently teach but we actually have an expertise in many other languages. Uh, so some of the languages are taught every year. Some languages are sort of taught, uh, maybe paused for one year and then uh, you know, taught the following year. So um, again, depending on which language you, you are interested in, um, that would be the sort of focus of, of your degree. What we also um, feel very, very passionately about is the fact that we provide our students with an experience in, in the country. So they can actually um, uh, you know, study in, in the region, they can improve their linguistic skills, but also it's the fact that they are able to immerse themselves in the culture of that particular region, uh, etc. So. Uh, Typically, we send our students for a year abroad. Um, I will explain the uh, proper structure of, of the program a little bit later on. And during that um, uh, year abroad, you obviously study the language, but also you usually work on some sort of independent study project. Uh, and uh, you, know, you are encouraged, obviously, get involved in this sort of really everyday life um, of, of the country in which you are li living. You are attending uh, courses you know, with uh, 
low cost students in many cases. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. And this is obviously the main part within the degree when um, you are really, you know, testing uh, your language skills and you are really improving uh, your language skills and hopefully very fast. Everything we do in our department, all uh, uh, aspects uh, and disciplines and uh, things we teach uh, are obviously based on uh, our academic research. Uh, we have um, uh, very experienced academics, researchers, scholars uh, who cover in their uh, research a broad range of topics and themes. And this research then informs our teaching the modules we propose and the modules that you can then um, attend. And as a basic, main, very important resource, we, we have a very well-stocked uh, library, um, which is one of the uh, national research libraries. So uh, if you have a chance to actually come to campus, please feel free to you know, visit the library. Uh, we, we, um, have very unique collections, especially in the uh, regional languages. Uh, we have, you know, archives and uh, special manuscripts collections. So uh, very many rare uh, resources that are obviously available to our students. Okay, so that's just simply by way of introduction. Um, but then maybe slightly more specifically about our main degree. So it's called BA Languages and Cultures. Um, and it's a degree which is now structured as part of our guided curriculum, which essentially means that um, uh, in year one, uh, the uh, program is stru structured in a guided way. So you have a limited um, choice in what you can do. Uh, you know, the, the curriculum is slightly more fixed even though there are some, some you know, options. In year two, then uh, your options uh, of freedom to cho choose the modules that you are interested in is slightly increasing. And then obviously in year three, uh, you have a little bit more uh, uh, option yet. Um, the year three is obviously the sort of culmination of, of the degree. And in most cases, the students uh, are working on their undergraduate uh, dissertation or independent study project, uh, which usually means that you can select a topic that interests you and you sort of draw on all everything that you have learned in the previous uh, years and you work independently uh, doing a really in depth research of that topic uh, and you present that in a very uh, you know, scholarly, academic. Uh, uh, project. All our, uh, uh, or this particular degree, but all our degrees in the department are, um, have a three year option without the year abroad or a four year option which includes the year abroad. Uh, although you may actually enroll on a three year option, it is relatively easy to transfer later on if you decide that you want to take the year abroad and transfer to a four year option. And vice versa, if for any reason you obviously don't want to go on the year abroad, then you can transfer to a, a, a three year degree program. Um, please, uh, I, I'm going to ask my colleagues, perhaps, you know, they, they, they can come in and, you know, uh, just um, add uh, what I have forgotten or just expand on some of the issues. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to add at the minute. I just to say that I've been looking at the chat and um, quite a few people interested in Korean, Japanese and or, or Korean, Japanese and other languages. So I wonder if Donna, you can say something about the options for combining languages. Uh, yes, and, uh, yeah. yes, obviously we are uh, 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 in this department, we, we, we have a separate department, which is called the Department of East uh, Asian Languages and Cultures, uh, which really specializes in the study of Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. Um, obviously, within the programs we offer here, 
uh, we, you can also, you know, uh, study some some of the East Asian languages, but uh, that's not essentially the whole department. Uh, we have uh, postgraduate programs that are also incorporate East Asian languages, but on the undergraduate level, uh, it's mainly, uh, you know, languages of Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So our main language, obviously, is Arabic. Uh, from the uh, Middle Eastern side, uh, but then we also teach Persian. Uh, on the uh, South Asian side, we teach uh, Hindi, Urdu, uh, Bengali, uh, but we also have expertise in some of the other languages. And on the African side, we teach Swahili, which is our biggest African language, but we also offer Yoruba. Um, and to some extent, in the past, definitely we had Somali. Uh, which we hope that we will be able to reintroduce. Um, so, um, perhaps, uh, Naresh, could you, could you uh, say something about the South Asia part of this program? Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, I've put a, my contact details in the chat, and also I've mentioned the South Asia languages that we offer. So the languages that run every year are Hindi, Urdu, and Sanskrit. And then sometimes we offer Prakrit, Punjabi, and Bengali as well. If you're interested in doing the year abroad, which um, would be in the third year of your degree, then it's usually to do Hindi, Urdu, or Sanskrit. And um, that can be a really significant part of the study experience going and um, you know spending the year the academic year in India, learning the language, being immersed in the environment, but also participating in other culture related activities whilst you're out there. So I would um, strongly con uh, recommend considering the four year option. Um, having said that, if you think it's too much to commit to a four year degree, then um, I believe, um, Dana, you could correct me if, if I'm wrong, that for some languages, we have a summer abroad um, option as well, where you can spend um, sort of eight to 12 weeks in an immersion environment and um, really building on the language that you've learned whilst you've been in classes in London. Um, what else can I tell you? I think that's about it. Yeah, you know, um, my email address is in there. If you have any specific questions, drop me an email. I'd be happy to to reply or, you know, set up an online meeting to talk about options. Thank you. Yes, just to add, uh, uh, as you can see, hopefully you can see, I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, shared with you a list of uh, some of the destinations where our students travel to when they are going for their year abroad. Uh, uh, sometimes we are now exploring the possibilities and we are increasingly allowing students to perhaps, you know, split the year abroad between two destinations. Uh, for example, for the Southeast Asia year abroad, uh, it is now possible to spend, you know, one term, say, in Vietnam and another one in Indonesia, because we, we do have students who obviously actually are real linguists and, and have a great passion for languages and they study more than one uh, language. So um, what, what normally happens in year one, you have to study one language and then in year two, uh, should you find it too difficult and uh, you can't cope, then we allow you to drop the language. But then on the other hand, there are actually students who really want to uh, study language in depth and therefore they take on uh, year two intermediate level and then they go abroad for a more advanced study of the language. Um, so, you know, there, there, are, there is a certain flexibility within the program uh, allowing you to really explore um, the cultures you are studying. Obviously, last uh, two years because of the COVID and the pandemic, you know, our year abroad program has been somewhat disrupted, but uh, some students are now already again abroad. Uh, some students did uh, a sort of online um, distance learning version. Uh, 
but we obviously hope that we will be able to reinstate all of our year abroad programs from the following session, which is obviously when you would be reasonably applying. Um, Talking about the language, I also just wanted to emphasize that um, we have really uh, huge expertise in, in uh, the teaching and research into uh, Asian, African, and Middle Eastern languages. Uh, many of our colleagues wrote, um, you know, language textbooks or grammars, descriptive grammars, and linguistic studies. And I have just, you know, uh, picked up some which are sort of commercial uh, books that came out of this expertise. Um, but we also um, have a principle that all students have access to a native speaker. So uh, normally our classes would be taught uh, by uh, maybe non-native non speaker, but an uh, expert in the particular language. But in that case, we will always also have a native speaker so that um, you know, can practice the language, the conversation uh, classes are always done by the native speaker. Uh, so you will get a lot of opportunities to obviously learn and practice the language. Um, I will. I think we have. Uh, oh yeah, uh, this is this is the main main um, uh, part which I have not yet emphasized. So BA Languages and Cultures, you can study as a single subject uh, degree, um, or you can obviously uh, study it as a joint degree program, which means that you would combine the languages and cultures part uh, with a discipline, uh, and you can essentially combine it with all the various disciplines taught around SOAS. You have some examples of their development, studies, economics, history, history of art, Law, linguistics, music, politics, uh, anthropology, world philosophies, etc. We also allow a combination of the languages and cultures with our uh, Arabic program. Uh, we have a separate Arabic studies program, but if you want just you know a little bit of the sort of Arabic um, language, then you can combine it with the languages and cultures. Normally what would happen is that really the program, if you do the joint uh, program, uh, your credits uh, would be sort of split evenly uh, between the two uh, subjects, so the languages and cultures and then the discipline. Uh, obviously there are certain synergies because in your uh, perhaps independent study projects or in some of your essays, you can actually combine these two sort of uh, parts of your degree together. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, really produce a very, very, very interdisciplinary um, research or study of a particular subject. Um, I will perhaps later on talk about you know some of the uh, uh, career destinations our students um, end up uh, with, but I think perhaps now uh, I would hand over to my colleague, Dr. Wajda just so that she can just give you some sort of insights into some of the modules or themes and uh, issues that we actually um, address in our uh, program. Um, Naresh, do you want to say something? First? Sorry, um, I just wanted to say that I have to head off. So um, good to meet you all. Please do get in touch if uh, you have any queries, any questions about South Asia related languages or studies. Um, good. Thanks. And um, see you later, Dana, Malaika, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So, so Dana, I wonder, can you make me a co-host so I can change the slides or can you change the slides for me? This is your first slide or do you want to start? I will you know, I'm very do it for me? Thinking. Okay. I am trying to make you co-host, but you know, co my I? screen is slightly obscured at the moment, so I can't see everything. Unfortunately. Oh yeah, I think. Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether I have the authority. You might not be able to. So I'll just ask you um, to change the slide when I when I. Yes, I, I <laughs> do I'm it. sorry. I I don't seem to be able to do that now. That's fine. Um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so so um, so as Dana said, I'm just going to be talking um, for ten 
15 minutes or so about to just give you an idea of what sort of things we do um, in uh, the classes on uh, the BA languages and cultures and to try to connect to some of the big questions that you that SOAS is really invested in and that you will be trying to answer uh, while you are um, while you are here if, if you come here. So one of the, uh, you, as you're sure you know, one of the big sort of strands um, uh, of inquiry at SOAS is this question of decolonizing the curriculum, the university, knowledge uh, as a whole. And, um, and, and this is something that's really threaded through a, a lot of things that we do. So you probably know uh, the history of SOAS, but it was set up very much as a colonial institution for training uh, those um, officials who, who went on to administer the, the, the British Empire. So obviously that's a very problematic history. And I, I, and what we have done at SOAS is that we, that we do recognize that and we have, and lots of people at the institution have been thinking about it um, and thinking about, and, and clearly, you know, times are very different now uh, and things are done extremely differently. But what we do um, then and now is this, as, as Dana said, a real emphasis on language acquisition that was really at the core of, of what SOAS was, was founded uh, when SOAS was founded, or, or you know, 1917, um, if I got that right, um, and so that was you know language acquisition and really understanding other cultures, other peoples was was essential to SOAS and, and it's essential to SOAS now. So now our questions and the reasons that we want to do that are different. Also. You know, who are we now? Well, if you come to, to SOAS, you'll see it's, it's extremely diverse in, in all kinds of ways. And, and, you know, that's really one of its great strengths as an institution. Um, but the question of how do we understand the rest of the world on its own terms from their own perspective, as, as Dana mentioned earlier. So this is a, a key question and one that I think we can get to, um, we can, one of the ways that we can try to answer it is by looking at literature produced you know in the rest of the world and really engaging in a in a detailed uh, informed um way with it and i think it i wanted to to put up a, a picture of abdul razak gurna because as many of you may know he was awarded the nobel prize for literature just last week i think um, and he is a, um, he writes in English and he's been in the UK for a long time, but he is of um, Tanzanian origin and from, from specifically from, from Zanzibar. And lots of his work engages with these questions, uh, you know, the big questions of our time, decolonization in broad terms, but the refugee experience, migration, uh, alienation and, and things like that. And I, re I was really, um, happy to discover that one of our, our lecturers in, in, in um, SLCL and Languages, Cultures and Linguistics, that's Dr. Ida Hajivayanis, who teaches Swahili, um, of course, the language of, of East Africa. Uh, she is, you know, long before the Nobel Prize, she has been working on a translation of uh, one of Abdul Razak Gurna's novels um, from English into Swahili. So, you know, I thought that's such a nice, um, so as, SLCL project. We have always been interested in this stuff, you know, before the Nobel Prize, before everyone started talking about decolonization, we were interested in it and we're still interested in it. And we, and if you come here, we will give you that linguistic cultural grounding to really um, engage in a meaningful way with, with, with works like, uh, like Gurna's, but lots and lots of others uh, as well. Um, okay, so, uh, Tana, could you change the slide next? Brilliant, thank you. So well, I wanted to talk to you about a module that I'm teaching and this is running for the first time this year. So I'm co-teaching it with uh, a colleague, uh, Dr. Anjaria, um, who works on Turkish. And so this is a, a core module for the BA Languages and Cultures and it happens in the second year uh, and it's called Understanding Texts. And the, the idea of this module is really to give students a, a grounding in textual interpretation. And this could be texts of all kinds. It could be literary texts, which is the focus of the first part of the, the module. 
also, you know, criticism, analytical text, and how do you make meaning out of it? How do you understand what is going on in it? Um, and so some, pe some students have, have done something like this, most perhaps have done English literature A-level, but we find that a lot of students haven't. So it is, you know, it's partly to develop the kind of analytical skills that you need throughout the degree, and also which are really useful uh, in professional life afterwards, you know, you will always need to know how to read something carefully, understand it, figure out what's going on in it, and express your opinion, your reasoned opinion in writing and orally. These are, these are skills that will serve you throughout your degree at SOAS and, and throughout your life. So partly the module is, is designed to inculcate that. And it's also to think about texts, literary production, um, in a non-Eurocentric uh, frame. So, um, you know, and, and in a way that most people probably haven't had the opportunity to do before they come to university. So if you did literature at school, depending on where you studied, what country you studied in, you know, it's going to be English literature or it's going to be the, um, the, the national literature of your, your country of origin. So what we try to do is open it up a bit more, uh, read literature in a bigger frame and of course you know strategies of interpretation ways of reading are going to be very very different from one context to another and another I think key sort of so as or else principle is that rather than just flattening it all out and say we can read all these things in the same way you know we assess literary value in the same way what we really want to stress is you need to understand the values of the culture, their aesthetic values, say. What a poem is good in the language that I study in Malay for these reasons. Those aren't the same as the reasons a poem is good in English. Um, and so you need to know both of those things and to sort of put them in, in dialogue with each other. Um, we also look in this module uh, a little bit at oral literature. So stuff that's not produced in writing. And this is something that, you know, exists in lots and lots of cultures around the world, but tends, but we tend not to um, study very much, you know, or come across very much in, in, in uh, our, our daily life in, in the modern West. Um, but it's really useful and it's a good challenge to our, our normal conceptions of, of literature and textual interpretation to look at that material as well. Um, we look at questions of translation. So how do you, if you read something in translation, can you interpret it in the same way as if you had access to the original? Now we would love you all to learn a language and to learn it to an advanced level. Um, and then you won't have the barrier of translation, but none of us can learn every language. Uh, so one of the things we, and there is great value still in reading things in translation, of course, but thinking about the issues around that. Um, so one of the things uh, that's quite interesting for me teaching this course uh, and, and seeing uh, what's the kind of questions that my students are asking. Um, and of course, it's, we're very much trying, you know, in, in all of our courses, I think to, to have the lectures and the tutorials to be interactive people you know i want to hear from my students not just them hearing from me and i want them to talk to each other because a lot of learning takes place between um, students so one of uh, my students is uh, slightly um skeptical i think about what's the point of reading literature what you know it's just a novel it's just a story that's all very well and good but what what's the point of that so i'm going to try and and suggest uh, one or one reason why uh, literature is good. And I'm going to use an example of why, why we can learn something worthwhile from it. Um, I'm going to um, show you. Um, so Donna, could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. So this is the novel that we, we are reading in this module, Understanding Text. Um, and it's a really uh, interesting one uh, by a Zimbabwean author um, published, sorry, originally came out in 1988. And this is the opening um, paragraph. And so this is Nervous Conditions by uh, Tsitsi Dangaremga. 
I'm reading it because I think it's a good, it's a really good opening paragraph. So, I was not sorry when my brother died, nor am I apologizing for my callousness as you may define it, my lack of feeling, for it's not that at all. I feel many things these days, much more than I was able to feel in the days when I was young and my brother died. And there are reasons for this more than the mere consequences of age. Therefore, I shall not apologize, but begin by recalling the facts as I remember them that led up to my brother's death, the events that put me in a position to write this account. For though the events of my brother's passing and the events of my story cannot be separated, my story is not after all about death, but about my escape and Lucia's, about my mother's and my guru's entrapment and about Nyasha's rebellion. Nyasha far-minded and isolated, my uncle's daughter, whose rebellion may not in the end have been successful. So we spent a whole uh, tutorial hour looking at this opening paragraph and just this opening paragraph, because what I'm trying to uh, get students to do is close reading. So a lot of the time, you know, you have a lot of, you know, when you come to university, you have a lot to read and people skim. You have to do that to some extent for some purposes, but sometimes we really need to focus. And one of the things that I want to emphasize is you get a lot if you concentrate uh, on this one paragraph. So here we have a very arresting first sentence, a very challenging first sentence. I was, I was not sorry when my brother died. And so critics have pointed out, and it's very obvious, right? This is a, um, a, a, a sentence, a defiant sentence. Um, and not the kind of one that you would expect stereotypically from uh, a woman uh, from the global south, right? Um, so, he, and we, we are already told from that very first sentence, the very opening paragraph, that we are in the presence of a, uh, a particular consciousness, someone who is able to articulate for herself, someone who is, um, yeah, so who is so secure in, in that sense of identity that she says, I know what you might think of me, my callousness as you may define it, my lack of feeling, but this isn't the story. When you hear my story, which is the whole novel, uh, you will understand differently. Uh, so a very self-possessed voice, but already, and again, just in this opening paragraph, we are told you know, there's a lot at stake. Um, and we, and it emerges that the brother's death put me in a position to write this account. So it is the, because the brother was sent to school. So the, because the brother was a boy, he was sent to school. Because the narrator was a girl, she was not sent to school. When the brother died, it became possible for her to go to school, therefore becoming literate and uh, I am in a position to write this account. So we are told, so it was, you know, how is it that this book is in your hands because my brother died? And this kind of uh, recognition of the, not guilt exactly, but she, has, she knows she has profited from her um, brother's death. So I won't wanna sort of replicate what we did in the class, but I hope that this gives you a sort of sense of how reading literature and really reading it with attention and focus um, and as literature you know uh, can really be rewarding and help us to answer these big questions these big sort of global questions because the first step is not to read it as anthropology or to read it as data about uh, the lives of others but when you treat it as a work of literature, a work of art, like, uh, like any other novel, then we can get, we can speak on the same level, right? We can, and then we can really learn about uh, this other uh, consciousness, this other way of living, this other cultural context. Um, so that's what I think, you know, literature can help us to do. Um, and that's one of the ways that we can maybe start to build a sort of different um, world, if that's not too much of a, a, a big claim. Um, but I think we can go to the next slide, Donna, please. Yeah, so th that this is a picture from one of my um, 
So my areas of Southeast Asia, this is a girl uh, illustration from the early 30s of uh, an engineer, Javanese um, woman uh, going to the library and, and um, reading books. So, and just to, you know, think about the, it's just as an illustration of the, the kind of cultural, different cultural contexts, different historical contexts, um, which we can all, we, all of which we can access in some way through reading these works of literature, if we are willing to do the, you know, certain amount of um, learning about the history, about the context, and ideally also about the language, then lots of things uh, will open up to us, just like um, to the to the narrator of of the novel I just um, we just talked about, and just like to the the reader um, pictured here. Um, I think that's the end of my slides. Um, yeah, so I will hand it over back to Dana to talk about the, the careers aspect. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. And I hope that you have all feel now so motivated that you will go and look up this uh, book and read it, uh, because I will definitely do it. Um, I am very much aware of the time. Uh, we have, you know, probably around well, only about 12, 13 minutes. And I obviously want to leave some time for your questions. So really, uh, the most of these questions we get asked by students is, you know, what do our students actually end up doing? Why study BA languages and cultures? Why to embrace, you know, the, the study of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East? What sort of practical um, benefits these uh, degrees actually have? Um, it would be very difficult for me to give you an uh, um, image of a typical student. We, we have really a very, very different students who uh, draw on different aspects of this degree program. So obviously there are students whose main interest is the language and therefore their careers would actually then rely on the knowledge of the language. So, Obviously, uh, uh, um, professions such as, you know, interpreters, translators, perhaps editors, uh, but also teachers. Uh, but then there are students who obviously perhaps draw more on some of the cultural um, uh, aspects uh, of the degree. Uh, quite a few of our students um, in the past uh, ended up working either for the, in the foreign office or the home office, the civil service, uh, diplomats, etc. Journalism, uh, publishing, and in modern times we have actually several students who are um, sort of independent um, advisors. Uh, they have their blogs or they have their sort of uh, small agencies working as advisor, advisors uh, to Westerners, uh, perhaps positioned in the region, but, uh, you know, advising. Um, quite a lot of our students uh, end up working for various NGOs or uh, charity organizations. And that's actually also often um, the source of students who come to our department because they might have actually, during their gap year, uh, gone to uh, the region and they would have been involved there and they then want to actually formalize their knowledge of the region by having a proper university education and grounding, academic grounding in, in the region. Um, but obviously, you know, just uh, any of the jobs that uh, require this sort of, you know, um, understanding of the culture, you know, work, working in uh, uh, museums, museum curators. We had few of our alumni who actually worked in the British Museum in charge of the regional collections, uh, librarians, uh, etc. Um, but obviously, some students uh, actually end up in the slightly non-academic uh, part of the uh, careers market, and they actually go for business. Um, even though we don't really focus predominantly on some sort of, you know. Um, economic, political issues. Obviously, within the study of culture, etc., we cannot uh, not to touch on, on uh, sort of political reality, historical reality, etc. And, uh, you know, the, this knowledge is very much uh, useful even in the sort of corporate world. Um, 
I just want to give you an example. For example, I have a student who did Vietnamese and he did a full degree. So he very much focused on Vietnamese culture, Vietnamese literature. And he then went and he was recruited by a very famous global um, uh, corporate company, uh, very difficult, very sought after, difficult to get into. And he was telling me how uh, most of his interview, the final interview before he was offered the job, he actually spent the interview discussing a Vietnamese novel. And I just want to sort of show you that, you know, obviously you learn a set of skills, obviously transferable skills, which come from the fact that you are reading, engaging with the text, you are writing essays, you are writing um, uh, presentations, you are talking to students, you are uh, skilled in presenting your argument or discussing uh, your points of view with other students. So all these skills are very practical and very transferable and that could be used in essentially any type of um, job beyond the obvious. So actually to have um, a degree such as this, which to some ex extent is slightly more specialized, um, that's something which usually makes you stand out in the job market. Uh, uh, you know, very many um, agencies and uh, companies are actually impressed when they see that you went beyond the obvious and that you went for something which, which is um, rightly or wrongly perhaps perceived as more uh, complicated, uh, uh, etc. And I mustn't forget those who are students who obviously are much more interested in an academic career perhaps. So there are um, students who obviously then go for a postgraduate study. Uh, very often, uh, either continue again within the sort of regional area studies, but very often they can go to a completely different, uh, you know, uh, study. So they sort of create an a, a extra level of knowledge to complement the undergraduate degree. Uh, and some obviously continue to do the uh, research degree, so MPhil or PhD. Um, so it's, it's actually a really, great mixture and, and you know sometimes we are really fascinated by hearing back from our students and learning what they do so because of the time i think i will sort of stop i will stop sharing the screen because at the moment i can't actually read your questions in the chat and please if anybody wants to ask by simply then you can obviously raise your hand and just ask the question and we will try to answer otherwise i will you know need to look through the, the questions and see if we have answered or not. Anybody wants to ask, please, uh, just... Uh, yeah, so th there's a question here um, from Fion, if I pronounce that right. Um, are there any opportunities to learn languages outside of your degree? Extra, so extracurricular, and I'm not quite sure what the language center, or what the uh, policy yeah. is. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we all, all students at SOAS can take a language uh, as their open option. So even those students who would not be registered on a language uh, degree, uh, they could study a language. And quite a few of our students obviously uh, do that. Now, um, we used to have something called language entitlement program, which actually allowed students to uh, attend some of the uh, language courses that are uh, taught um, in the language center. <clears throat> uh, aside from our sort of academic uh, uh, departments, we also have a language center, which is basically really a language tuition provider uh, to general public. And most of the uh, courses that obviously are taught in the evening as evening courses. Um, so I think that's one opportunity, but uh, at the moment, I'm not sure whether uh, students can actually attend these modules free of charge. I think you would be definitely given a discount, but um, uh, I think that that would uh, you know, be paid. Having said that, um, if you already have some basic knowledge uh, and you want to perhaps improve, there are a lot of student societies and exchanges and you can find, you know, somebody. Uh, so as is a very sort of uh, international institution. We have students from all over the world uh, speaking so many different languages. So many of our students perhaps, you know, uh, 
pair up with, with uh, a fellow student and maybe they help them uh, with improving their English while uh, the student from Vietnam helps them with their Vietnamese, um, etc. Um, I'm sorry, I, I really can't read the questions. Very yeah, well. okay, then I, I can read it. I don't there was a lot of discussion about the Japanese uh, side of things, which Penny has very kindly answered. Uh, yes. I don't think... Um, I guess I, I would add to, to, to what Dana just said, that if you, know, if you are thinking of doing a language, then I really encourage you to have it be part of your degree. Because although you know there's so many things to study and the temptation is, oh, I'll audit or I'll take it on when you do you're going to be so busy um and it, it so if you really want to you know progress in a language and do it then it, i really encourage you to put it into your degree so that you're going to get the most possible out of it um the question about is there a japanese society um penny do you want to answer yeah there is a japan society where uh you can pop in and there will be people who are actually from Japan that you can talk to in Japanese. Uh, so don't be afraid if you feel you, like you can't because you can even just sit there and listen in on it. And I was hearing from my colleague who's now doing a PhD in Japanese studies. Um, she said that some people from like Honda, the car company came over into the Japan society just to talk because they were like, hi, I'm lonely. No one speaks Japanese at the office, so I thought I'd stop by. So you can meet all kinds of people there. Thank you. Uh, and I think this would be similar for any of the regions, you know, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, because we have uh, regional centers uh, that uh, organize um, seminars. So you can attend, uh, you know, wine bridge of activities if you are interested in a particular uh, country or language, etc. Of course, SOAS is positioned at the heart of London, you know, in the Bloomsbury, behind the British Museum, very close to the British Library, Royal Asiatic Society, and any of uh, these sort of uh, famous institutions. So, uh, you know, there's a lot um, of activities where you can actually, outside SOAS, still, you know, uh, expand your knowledge and get involved. So, any, any more questions? Any questions? Uh, so, Fiona again, I'm interested in studying Japanese, Korean, or Arabic. Any tips on how to choose which one? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very, very tricky question, isn't it? Uh, obviously, that depends on your sort of personal interests. Um, you are spanning, you know, different, different areas, uh, different cultures. Um, I can speak about the Arabic. Uh, our Arabic program is obviously quite quite uh, broad. Uh, we have a number of Arabic modules at all levels, and we have also a very intensive Arabic studies program. But also we have uh, a slightly less intensive for those who want to learn just the basics of, of the Arabic language without obviously uh, becoming a completely sort of fluent. Or uh, so the full. Um, in-depth Arabic studies program, obviously you study, um, you spend many hours a week dedicated to uh, um, uh, the study of Arabic language, while for the non-intensive uh, version, you would probably have four hours, as is the case for most of our languages, you usually have four hours per week of language tuition. But otherwise, I really don't feel <laughs> really sufficiently, I don't know you to advise you um, uh, on, on your choice. Uh, so, any, anything? So, before, before perhaps we, we close this session, uh, just to uh, say that um, obviously you have all this information on our website. So, if you go to the school, so our School of Languages and Cultures and Linguistics, more specifically, if you find the BA Languages and Cultures program, you will find uh, a more detailed structure. You will see actually the modules that you can take, the options that are available to you throughout the degree program. 
And uh, most importantly, you have the name of the convener, which is Dr. Ben Mata, who couldn't be here today, but uh, you have his email address there as well. So uh, you can email him, but you know, you can email anybody, me, uh, Dr. Hijas, but any of our colleagues, uh, because uh, if you are interested in a specific language, specific region, then it's very easy on our website. We have all members of staff listed with their email addresses uh, and their specialism. So if you want to actually know more about Arabic classes or Swahili classes, then you know you can email directly and all colleagues are very happy to you know engage in conversation and uh, give you more. Yeah, and just to add to, I, I think if you look at the SOAS YouTube channel, I know last year during lockdown, most of the language teachers did like a language taster thing. Um, so you could have a look on there. Uh, and so if you really are choosing completely blind between Arabic, Korean, whatever, you know, have a look um, and, and see how you feel about the different language tasters. Yes, all our email addresses are obviously on the website, but if you want more specifically, mine is the uh, DH4. We usually use the initials for our email addresses. Uh, so it's dh 4 at soas.ac.uk and Mulaika is MH and what's the number? 86. Uh, 86, yeah. And then again, the soas.ac.uk. Uh, but um, yeah, please feel free to email us. Yeah, and our next session is about Arabic. Um, so students now who mentioned about Arabic, you can attend for our Arabic session uh, later at 2 p.m. And because we need to finish now to start next session. So okay. thank you, everyone. And I will end the meeting for now. Is that OK? OK, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.